folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2012 with another Watchman video broadcast. The egg. Have you ever thought about this? Sure you have. This time of year, you know, here comes Peter Cottontail hopping down the bunny trail. I never could figure out, all the time I was a kid, I could never figure out what an egg had to do with bunny rabbits. Could never figure that out. Now, I like fried eggs. And I happen to like fried rabbit, but I never ate the two together, never connected the two together. And yet every year, around the time of, of Easter, um, I was told that a little bunny went around hiding eggs everywhere. And we had to go out in this nice clothes that we had, because you had to wear your Easter suit. And we dressed up in these nice clothes and had these little baskets. We walked around looking for the eggs that the bunny rabbit, Peter Rabbit, the Easter bunny. Uh, I even had, I even had one time, I don't know if you remember this, I had gotten an Easter basket when I was a kid that had a big plastic bunny rabbit coin bank. And it had, and I kept all of my coins in there. And the thing that irritated me about this coin bank was it didn't have one of those things at the bottom where you screwed it like that and it came loose and you could get your money out. Once I put the money in there, it was in there. I never got to get it out. I don't know what happened to that. But I've seen those around before. I think they still sell them. But anyway, and the interesting thing is, is that the ones they sell now have the word bank written across the bunny's forehead. I don't know if that has anything to do with book revelation or not. But anyway, I got to thinking about uh, the Easter controversy. You know, some churches, I, I pulled up here, uh, some churches, uh, here's Tower Grove Baptist Church, which is in our community, had a community Easter egg hunt. Here's another one, another church doing the Easter eggs extravaganza. Oh, how witty they are. <clears throat> churches doing Easter egg hunts. Now, I can remember a time when yours truly here at Bethel Church, when I was growing up, we used to have Easter egg, egg hunts all the time. We that was at the time when we were doing, um, you know, Halloween parties here at the church. And we even had a, uh, like a Halloween a scary house in all the Sunday school rooms. I remember those days. Um, you did all those things in innocency a long time ago. You grow up, you start thinking about things, you start doing a little research. Um, and you find out that some things maybe were probably better left undone. Now, let me, let me say this before I say anything else in this broadcast. And I'm going to teach you, um, I'm going to teach you the symbolism of what this egg, of what it represents, the whole thing about Easter and everything like that. And somebody even asked me about uh, the word Easter in the King James Bible. And some people are saying, see, it's wrong. The King James Bible's wrong. It's got the word Easter in it. And everybody knows that's a pagan holiday. <clears throat> yeah. And it's in there for a reason. And I, I actually am going to show you why. It is the right word to be in that place, and the translators knew it. But um, we have all these little, what we call traditions, these Easter traditions. Nobody ever questioned where they came from. Nobody ever bothered to ask, because we don't really normally think that the day-to-day -day things that we're doing are really occultic or pagan or put us in alignment with the New World Order somehow, some way. Um, and so, all the things that I'm going to say today, I, I don't want to necessarily um, accuse any church or any Christian of, of being a pagan, of worshiping the devil, um, of practicing sacred fertility rites by having your kids go out and find little chocolate Easter bunnies and hit, that you hid in the grass. Uh, I remember one time, one time, I got the uh, special egg. And I don't know if you know what that is. I don't know who all does this, but one year my mom and dad, they took, I don't know if you remember this or not, remember pantyhose used to come in these little egg-shaped containers. They were called legs. And mom would save the containers and every year at Easter time, we would, my sister and I, we would go out and try to find. Now these things were great big. And one time, one time I found the special legs pantyhose container that had a dollar in it. 1974, you're talking, man, you're talking a dollar bill. That's like a lot of money. And that was the first time I ever won anything like a contest. And I just, I remember feeling so special. It was about that same year that I, that I got saved. I, I, don't want, I don't want to 
I don't want to make people think that I think you're all pagans because you like to eat eggs, boil eggs, color eggs. I, I, I don't want you to think that. I don't want you to think that just because a church or a religious group some, somehow, some, or church people that you know, uh, buried little candies in the yard for kids and kids went out and, and did those things and so on. I, I don't want you to think that. People, people are going to hell or they're going to heaven because they're saved by the grace of Almighty God. And that grace is sustaining grace. And that grace also uh, kind of helps us as we grow and mature as Christians, see things that maybe we shouldn't do anymore. Now, we at Bethel Church, we didn't have a church-sponsored Easter egg hunt, but I do know some families that went out and buried little things in the yard for the kids, and the kids went out and ate them, and okay... Um, I'm not going to get all bent out of shape over that as their pastor because I know these people and I know their lives and I know that they want to serve the Lord and they, they don't necessarily need me tapping them over the shoulder every time they do something and say, oh, I'm sorry, that's pagan. Uh, you can't do that. So I, I try not to be that way. So the information that I'm going to give you is more in line of a prophetic nature rather than for you to use as ammunition against all the people that you don't like, that you know for a fact they ate a boiled egg on Sunday, Easter Sunday morning. And, uh, and so anyway, I, I want to teach you this. The word Easter itself, where does it come from? I, you know, at, at the time growing up, as a child growing up in church, to me, Easter was synonymous with getting up, having a little Easter egg hunt, <coughs> and then uh, putting on this nice... I have pictures of me and my sister and my mom in our very, very nice 70s Easter outfit. Yes, it was a leisure suit, okay? Uh, getting ready to come to church for me all the time. That, that Easter day was a special day where we celebrated not necessarily the Easter bunny and the sacred egg, but we celebrated the risen Jesus Christ who right around the same time that Easter usually is, and I'll tell you how Easter, you ever notice that Easter is not the same time every year? I'll tell you how they pick that out. It's rather interesting. Um, right around the same time is, of course, the Jewish holiday of Passover, and that, of course, is when Jesus who was the Lamb of God, became our Passover sacrifice for us, died, his blood being shed in our place, so that when God sees his blood, he now passes over us and death has not dominion over us. But I started doing a little research into Easter. I've never really done this before, but I started doing a little research into the word Easter itself. And here's, here's what I found. Let me, let me put Mr. Egg over here. Okay, uh, Here's what I found. Easter, of course, as probably some of you know, was named after um, a, a goddess, a pagan goddess. Um, this is about the cleanest picture that I could find uh, concerning... Easter. She is a pagan goddess, and nine times out of ten, in her uh, in her images, she's going to be she's going to be stark naked. Okay, she's not going to have any clothes on, and there's and why. She has to do with fertility. She was called Easter or Esther. Hold on a second. Um, we have a book in our Bibles, our King James Bibles, called the Book of Esther. Where does that name come from? It comes from the word. Easter, or there are variations of it, Ishtar, Ashtaroth, Isis. But Esther, her Jewish name was Hadassah, and the Jews still regard her as that way, by that name. But she was given the name by King Ahasuerus as he, was, he named her after the pagan fertility goddess Esther, which to him was quite an honor. Okay, he's now married. You remember he had, uh, uh, who was it, Queen Vashti, and she didn't please him. So he put her out of the way and brought in Esther, this Jewish woman, Hadassah, and he named her after his, in his mind, his most sacred goddess in the world. It was quite a, quite a title of, of honor. Uh, doesn't make, necessarily make it good, but that's what he thought of her. And so he named her after this, after his his fertility goddess is what he did. Uh, Ishtar and Ashtaroth, the word Isis. And really, if you kind of do a little, if you know just a little bit, just a teeny tiny bit of Hebrew, 
You'll know that in the Old Testament, um, the word a Adam, the name Adam, uh, he, his wife was called the woman. And in Hebrew, the, the man is called Ish. And in Hebrew, it's Isha. Okay, so think about the Hebrew word Isha, meaning woman. And then after Babel, when it gets to Egypt, it's not Isha, it's Isis. And then in the Sumerians, it's uh, Ashtaroth. And in the Babylonians, it's Ishtar or Esther or some other variation. Now, then you understand the concept. And it started out as just meaning woman. But I want you to remember, I want you to think about something as we, as we do this. I want you to think of who is it that the serpent approached in the Garden of Eden. He didn't go after Ish, which is the man. He went after Isha, the woman. He wanted to plant a seed in her mind. And that was his words that came forth. By the way, in the King James Bible, 46 of those words came forth and seeded into the woman a concept that if she ate of the fruit, that she would become a god and, and, and all this stuff. And so that's kind of in the back of my mind as I'm studying this. And this idea that uh, Ishtar or Easter or Esther or Ashtaroth or Isis or any of these variations, she represents the goddess of fertility. Now... If uh, you, you don't have to use much of your imagination to understand that if she was worshipped as a goddess of fertility, there's probably a pretty interesting way that she was worshipped, and that's exactly right. And know that God did not want his people worshipping Isis, Ishtar, Ashtaroth, Esther, Easter, or, or whatever she was called. They did not want her being worshipped this way, this way. In fact, in fact, there was a whole land that was called the land of Ashtaroth in Joshua chapter 13. I want you to notice who is it that is the king of Ashtaroth. All the kingdom of Og. Now, that's not Egg. That's Og. All the kingdom of Og in Bashan, which reigned in Ashtaroth and in Edre, who remained of the remnant of the giants, for these did Moses' might and cast them out. So you need to understand that Og is a, um, he's a hybrid. He's a giant. His father was the sons of God. That's Genesis chapter 6. His mother was an earthly woman. You see this concept all throughout in Morals and Dogma. In fact, even the, um, the logo uh, the double-headed eagle denotes the sons of God and the daughters of men fused together. That would be Og, and his kingdom was over the land of, of Ishtar, Ashtaroth. In Judges chapter 2, notice this. Here's what the Israelites did. They get into the promised land after defeating Og, the king of, uh, the, king of the giants. They get into the land, and all of a sudden, they just turn their back on God. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not longer stand before their enemies. And so as, as, as soon as these people got into the land of promise and God was really going to bless them, they turned their back on God, went after Baal, which is uh, the, like the sun god, and they went after Ashtaroth. They went serving these, this god and this goddess together. It's sort of like um, Osiris and Isis together. And those two come together, and of course they make Horus and so on. He's the hybrid. And so that's what that idea of the word Easter comes from. It comes from Ashtaroth, and that was the whole thing that God did not want any of the Israelites to go doing. He did not, and he used the word to go a whoring after them. And that's interesting because when we're dealing with Ishtar or Ashtaroth or Esther or Easter, we're dealing with a, we're dealing with a spirit in the Bible. She is called by various names, but we end up finding out that her name is, in Revelation chapter 17, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, an abomination to the earth. And I want you to think as we're going through this that Ashtaroth or, or um, you could call her Jezebel, you could call her um, any other names in the Bible. Uh, you, uh, you, uh, Babylon the Great does not like God's people. She hates them. She hates their guts. She wants them all dead. 
Okay, we'll see that as we move on. First uh, Kings chapter eleven. Solomon, the wisest man in the world, fell for the goddess worship Ashtaroth. First Kings chapter eleven verse five. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Milcom would be uh, sort of like the Osiris or the Saturn of all of this. We have the male deity and the female deity. And what does the male and the female deity do when they get together at the, at the dance? Okay, the fertility rite. Uh, the Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did his father. And I can tell you that any time you have a situation where you have churches or you have individual Christians, or you have people in general whose heart is not fully turned over to the Lord, there's always going to be a replacement spirit. And that is going to be Ashtaroth, it's going to be Ishtar, it's going to be Mystery Babylon the Great. It's going to be the goddess somehow, some way. The feminine harlot spirit is always going to come in and she's going to bring a whole truckload of her practices with her. You might want to say that Ashtaroth really is the reason why all of these preachers now are getting up in the, in, on their little pulpits and they're talking about sex, and they're talking about sex, and oh, next Sunday we're going to talk about sex, and for, for the next seven weeks we're going to talk about, you know what, this is why they're doing it, because they will not serve God with their whole heart, and since there's a void there, this is where she comes in. Now, this is what I thought was really, really interesting. I want you to think about this, and its relationship to Easter, Ashtaroth, Ishtar. Now, she is a fertility goddess. She represents the ability of mankind to reproduce himself, and she gives that power. The earth is actually described this way, but Gaia. Gaia and Mother Earth, there's that word there, Mother, is worshipped because of her ability to produce fruit or to reproduce. Now, this is what was interesting, is that there is a, a medical term that we use all the time. Well, I don't use it all the time, but women, when they go see their doctor, they use this all the time. A medical term, it actually is a, uh, it's a hormone in women that actually causes fertility. It's called estrogen. And yes, it was named after Easter, Ishtar, Ashtaroth, Isis, and estrogen all have the same function. You see, estrogen has to do with, and I, I can't believe that I'm talking about this. I mean, if you knew, I'm just like the most shy, uh, I don't talk about this stuff, but th th just follow with me here for a minute because I, I, think it, I think it helps us understand some things in the Bible, understand what's going on. Uh, you see, estrogen, named after Easter, has everything to do with this, okay? Ovulation, ovulation, the ovule, which is the egg, okay? Now, um, all of us grown-ups know, and, and I'm going to use uh, non-offensive, non-crude language. All of us grown-ups know that women, and this is actually in the law, so I can, I can say certain things like this, uh, women have... Uh, they have a cycle, just like the earth has a cycle. We have, uh, you know, summer, fall, winter, and spring, and the whole year goes in cycles, and there is a, a time when the earth is, is fruitful, okay? There's a time when the earth can produce. There's a time, especially in the northern hemisphere, when the earth doesn't produce, okay, and, and, and it's a cycle. And we, we talked about that in the video we did called the cycles of, of Christian growth. Even, even us Christians, we grow, but we do so in cycles. There's a time when, when we feel like God is really doing great things in our life, and there's a time when we're just like, oh man, I don't feel like I'm very, very, very saved at all. And everybody goes through those cycles. If you'd like a copy of that video, call us. We'll send it to you. It, it, it'll really, it helped me a lot understand that not every day am I supposed to have revival. Uh, it just doesn't happen that way. And so God designs cycles, and everything that's in the universe goes in a, in a cycle fashion. And so the, the woman and her ability to produce a child goes in that same cycle. It happens about every 28 days. And estrogen has everything to do with maintaining 
that cycle. Now, just uh, again, let me, you, you've probably seen this graphic, but just the idea that there for a while, the woman is, is fertile, long about day 14 of that cycle. I mean, she is, she, her body is ready to reproduce. Then after, if that doesn't happen, then that kind of, it wanes away, it, it diminishes away, and then it goes around to the opposite end of that cycle, and the body has to cleanse itself during that time, and it uses, it uses blood. Okay, and, and I think that God actually designed it that way to show us that the woman, and think of the, the symbolism of the woman in the Bible. The woman in the Bible is a picture of the church. Okay, And I want you to understand this, that Christ intends to show that the church is cleansed by blood. I, I don't care what you think of what I'm talking about right now, I'm telling you, that this is a beautiful picture of God's design, all right? And so anyway, but during that time, the body is, is, is cleansing itself and it's using blood to do that. And at that time, the woman is not, is not fertile. She's not ready to, to bear any fruit, okay? Now, I said all that, whew, I said all that to say this. Um, when, I was a, when I was a kid, we would... Uh, we would peel these things, and we always have the little dye stuck on the end of our finger, and we would we would bite into them, and I loved I love these things. We would bite into them, and that little the yolk that's in the middle of it, we called it the moon. I don't know why. I guess it was round and you know glowing, but that that's what we called it, and we did that in childhood silliness. Actually, we weren't too far off because. The woman's cycle is actually named after the moon. Because the moon, the lunar cycle, matches almost day for day the woman's cycle. You see, when the, when the moon is, is bright up in the sky, kind of like the, the moon in the middle of this egg here, when the moon is bright up in the sky, um, it is at its strength. It's it, it just glowing, and, 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 and we just look at, oh, look, it's a full moon, and you can just walk around at night with no headlights on or anything like that. Um, that's about halfway through the cycle. The moon cycle is about 28 to 29 days, almost exactly the same time as the woman's cycle. Okay, but, but then after it's bright for about a day or two, it's called the waning moon. It starts, it starts diminishing in brightness and we see the shadow of the earth slowly creep in and we don't see after a while, after about another 14 days, we don't see the moon anymore. And the moon is dark, you can't see it. It's called the, it's called the new moon. Actually, there's like we don't even really see one, but it's called the new moon. Because the cycle is starting all over again, and during that time, the moon is, is, is not bright at all. It doesn't shine. And I want you to get this. At that same time, in a woman's cycle, she's not, she's not bearing any fruit. She's not capable of bearing any fruit at that time. And so I want you to get the picture that uh, the woman, when she is ready and she is fertile, corresponds to the same time that the moon is bright. And when the moon is totally dark, that corresponds to the same time when the woman is not fruitful and she is cleansing her body with her blood. Now, that got me thinking, and I'm just going to give you a verse and a concept, and we'll see if the Lord takes it anywhere, but it, to me it was very interesting. And by the way, I 100% believe that God designed it this way. I mean, I do. I don't think the pagans came up with this idea at all. God designed it this way. Um, I kept seeing over and over and over in the scripture that right before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in the clouds, you remember what the prophecy is? The prophecy is, and it's Isaiah 13, it's in Joel, it's in Matthew, it's in the book of Revelation. We see it over and over, Acts chapter 2, the same prophecy repeated. The stars are going to fall. The sun is going to be turned to darkness. The moon is also going to turn. Now, in one place, it'll say the moon will turn dark. 
Okay? Well, that happens to be a natural phase of the moon. The moon will turn dark. But then in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 31, remember the correspondence now that we have between the moon and the woman at that exact same time. Joel, chapter 2, verse 31, look at the scriptures. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and look at here, and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. I just think that that is, uh, I just think that's interesting. Maybe the Bible is more literal than we ever see. I cannot imagine a scenario in my mind where the moon would actually physically turn into blood. But maybe, maybe God means something by this and he wants to give his people, the people who actually believe the Bible, he wants to give them wisdom. And so, and by the way, eggs are mentioned in the Bible, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So we have this correspondence between, uh, between the goddess, Ishtar, Ashtaroth, Esther, um, Easter, whatever her, her name is, and of course, the moon. And uh, you'll all, if you get into pagan witchcraft jewelry, you'll see that witches love the moon. That's their symbol. It's a symbol for fertility, probably because it has everything to do with the waxing and the waning of the of the woman's cycle and her ability to produce and so on. Probably has everything to do with that. Uh, and that's how Isis was worshipped. In fact, in fact, let me, let me kind of connect the dots here for you. Okay, um, I told you earlier that this is how Easter is actually um, figured out, because Easter is not on the same day every year. It's on a it's on a different date. It's always on a Sunday, but it's never the same exact Sunday. It's never like March 12th or whatever it is. Okay, Here's how it's figured out. The date of Easter is actually determined by the moon. Okay, Now, the, and, and think of Easter as being a pagan holiday because it is. Okay, It's after Astaroth. It's after fertility and all these things that we talked about. So Easter is actually determined by the moon. Uh, it's the first Sunday after the first full moon. Now, remember, the full moon represents ovulation. Okay, When the ovule or the egg is ready. Okay, that's what the full moon represents. So it's the first Sunday after the full moon. So you see a full moon, the first Sunday after that, after, and the, it can't be just the first full moon of the year. It has to be the first full moon after the vernal equinox. What is the vernal equinox? It is the, um, the day, that's the spring equinox, usually around March 20th, March 21st, when there's exactly 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. That's equality. Mainly, uh, Albert Pike talks a lot about that. We'll, we'll discuss that. Anytime you have a symbol in, in pagan ideas or the occult of equality, you have the, the joining together or the balancing of things that are opposite. Light and darkness, sun and moon, male and female. They're balanced so that they can be together. That's what that represents. That's what the equinox. So they take the equinox, which has a pagan concept behind it, or the pagans pulled a concept from this. After all, God is the one who designed the spring and the summer and the autumn and the winter. He's the one that designed all of that. Don't ever forget that. Don't be afraid of certain days on the calendar. Oh, that's pagan. That day's pagan. Don't be afraid of that. God is the one who made the days. God is the one who put the stars in their course in Genesis chapter 1 so that they could be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. The lunar orbit, the, the course of the stars, the sun, and, and the sun rising east to west, the sun also rising north to south. We'll see that in a little bit. God is the one who designed that. It's the devil that said, I'm going to latch onto that and make some big pagan thing out of it. And that's what he did. So they take the equinox, uh, 12, 12 hours and 12 hours, it represents equality, fusion together, sons of God, daughters of men. And the first full moon that comes after that, which means she's ready. And then we take the first Sunday after that and say, this is when we're going to celebrate um, the fact that the egg has produced something. We'll find out what it is the egg has produced. Okay, You remember, in fact, here it is. You remember, we dealt with this here a while back. Um, this brings in the, the, the Easter celebration, brings, it comes to the, brings to the end the whole Lenten celebration. 
which of course is the 40 days weeping for Tammuz, which uh, we saw in Ezekiel chapter 8. It was the abomination that God saw in the north part of the temple where the women were weeping for Tammuz. You know who Tammuz was? It's the God that died and he awaits a resurrection. Okay, that's what it means. So 40 days, but remember Lent is longer than 40 days. It's actually 46 days. That's the same number of words that the devil spoke to Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's the same number of chromosomes that you and I have where our DNA, I want you to think of DNA looking like two snakes because we're going to see that in a little bit, all right? So anyway, but that's what Lent denotes, 46 days before Easter, and that's what Easter represents. It represents... There's something, something buried in the egg. I wonder what it is. Because when we, when we went around collecting Easter eggs, we weren't just going, oh, here, Mom, I got some eggs. You can fry those up you know, next Sunday or whatever. We knew that these things were hard-boiled. There was something in there that we wanted, and we would peel them and eat them. Or if we had the you know, pantyhose legs, there was always something in there. I wonder if I got the special prize. That's what, that's what Easter egg hunting is all about. It's about finding a secret, something that's hidden, and there's a secret stored in here. That's what this whole thing is all about. So we bring in this, this symbol now of the serpent and the egg. Here is one graphic here showing actually two serpents with an egg in their mouth. They're, the two serpents are fused together and joined by the egg. Again, this is what Manley Hall has in the, uh, in the front of uh, Morals and Dogma, is the two-headed eagle, eagle joined together in the same body. This shows you that, this symbol shows you that by the fusion of these opposites, there's a secret to be found right here in the middle, somehow, some way. Look at the serpents. They kind of look like little strands of DNA hidden, hidden in the 46 things. There's a special secret here, the 46 words that the devil spoke. The 46 words that they spoke in the Tower of Babel when they wanted to build that tower. Think about that. Um, the Masonic symbol of the two Johns. You have John the Baptist and John the Divine. And I want you to note and think about this. In, in uh, mythology, not necessarily in the Bible, but in mythology, John the Baptist is this hairy, gruff guy that eats locusts and wild honey. Okay? John, in Christian mythology, not in the Bible, but in Christian mythology, John is this sort of effeminate, soft-spoken guy who has pale skin. That's why when da Vinci drew the person sitting next to Jesus, and everybody said, well, that's, that's John, um, it, it wasn't. It was, it was a woman. It was Mary Magdalene. So when you look at the image again of the two Johns, you have one John and the other John. One's kind of very masculine and one's kind of a little feminine. And that, notice that they're standing on these, these two lines here with the, I want you to look at this, the circle with a point in the middle of it. What, what's in here? Okay, this is a, like a circle and it's got a little dot in the middle of it. Think about it. Okay, but they're showing that if you read uh, Albert Pike, you read Manley Hall, read some of these other books I have up here, they'll, they'll tell you that, um, that these two Johns and these two lines represent the equators. Why? The, the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. Why? Because, and we talked about this. Because every year, and I love this, I absolutely love this. God showed me this. And remember, God designed this. Okay, God is one who said the sun is going to rise in the east and set in the west. He also said it's going to rise from the south and then go back down again. Wait a minute. Every year, every year, I'll put this graphic on the screen. And I'm going to use this little illustration. You can't see it very well. But every year, the sun starts down here and is over on... Um, on uh, the, um, the, the winter solstice, okay, winter solstice, December 21st, the sun is over, directly overhead at the Tropic of Capricorn, okay? From the winter solstice to the spring equinox, now the sun is directly over the equator, okay, directly overhead. Shows balance, 12 hours in a day. Then, during the summer solstice, the sun rises again up to the Tropic of Cancer, Okay, that's the summer solstice. Then back down to the fall equinox, it's over the equator, and then back down to the winter solstice, it's over the Tropic of Capricorn again. Okay? The difference in, in uh, latitude. 
between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer. 46 degrees. It's the same number of days of Lent. It's the same number of words. It's the number of chromosomes where our DNA is. There's a secret inside the egg. Okay? And it looks to me like our DNA is the egg. Okay? That's what it looks like to me. And so anyway, now, um, getting to this word Easter in the Bible. Um, I was confronted with this years ago. Oh, man, I cracked my egg. I was confronted with this years ago because uh, we're going go to uh, we're gonna go to Acts chapter 12. There are people out there, <laughs> can you believe this? There are people out there that don't like the King James Bible. And they will look for anything in the world to make it look like the King James Bible was uh, either a terribly flawed translation or... There are some people out there that are into all the conspiracy theories. Oh, they've read this, and they've read this, and they've read this, kind of like me. But they heard somebody say that the pagans, the, uh, the evil uh, Rosicrucians like Francis Bacon and others, they're the ones that secretly planted hidden words inside the King James Bible. And they say in Acts chapter 12, that word Easter, everybody knows it couldn't be Easter. Okay? They're saying that it's a faulty translation because of this word here. In Acts chapter, let's read it. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. Now I want you to stop right here. Herod hates the church. Remember what spirit hates God's people. It's Mystery Babylon the Great. Herod stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James the brother of John with the sword. And because it saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Now stop right here. Stop right here. Then were the days of unleavened bread. So he's killed, he's killed James. Okay. Now he's captured Peter. It's going to kill him. Now, and the Bible tells you, it pinpoints that they are in the days of the unleavened bread. You know what that means? That means that there was a seven-day feast after Passover called the Days of Unleavened Bread. It was a feast that they had, and they were somewhere in those days. Passover had already occurred, and now they were into the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Go search this out in the Scriptures. It's right there. The answer is right there. Okay. Then were the Days of Unleavened Bread. Now verse 4. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, everybody knows that Easter is a pagan holiday. Okay? And here's what they say. They say the Greek word here, where it says Easter, in the original Greek it says Pascha. And they note that every other place in the entire New Testament where it says Pascha, it's translated as Passover. And they said, see, these dumb King James translators, they didn't know what they were doing. They were so infested with paganism, they thought that Easter was Passover. <laughs> well, that's not true. It's totally not true. You see, had the King James translators translated this word as Passover, it would have created a, a, a real problem with the text. Because they were already past Passover. Now they were into the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They, Passover was days ago. He wasn't holding him until after Passover because it had already happened. He was waiting because, remember, Easter, as we celebrate it now, and Passover, they kind of overlap sometimes. Herod wasn't waiting for Passover to end. He was waiting for the pagan festival of a very, very bloodthirsty goddess who's ready to be fertilized. Who's ready to bring forth her little secret that she has. That's what Herod was doing. The word Easter right here is the exact word that needs to be in the Bible. In every other Bible, including the New King James, that doesn't have the word Easter here, they're wrong. They're just simply Wrong. Let me show you where I'm going with this. Okay, remember now, Herod's wanting to kill all the Christians. He's got, he killed James, wants to kill Peter. What spirit is it that's bloodthirsty 
after the martyrdom of the saints. Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Verse 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. You see, you know what Easter wants? Easter wants to sit down and have a bloody Mary. She wants to sit down and have a bloody drink. She's drunken with the blood of the martyrs and the saints of the living God. She is blood thirsty and she wants more blood. This goes all the way back. Think of the egg as being a symbol of the earth. Go all the way back to the book of Genesis chapter 4. The first martyr was Abel. Remember Cain? He slew his brother Abel. What happened? Genesis chapter 4 verse 10. And he said, Why has, what, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's what? Blood crieth unto me from where? The ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, the earth which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thine hand. As soon as Abel's blood, righteous Abel's blood hit the ground, the earth opened her mouth and drank it up. Did you know the same thing happened on the day Jesus died? The moment that the soldier pierced his side and blood and water issued forth, the Bible says there was a great earthquake and the rocks were went and the ground opened her mouth. She was drinking in that blood. And she is blood. She is a fertility goddess, but she is bloodthirsty after the blood of the saints and the martyrs and the innocent. That's who she is. Even in the days of Saul, 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 8, remember when Saul was killed? Look what happened. And it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa, and they cut off his head, stripped off his armor, and sent into the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. And they put his armor. Where, where did they take his armor to? The house of Ashtaroth. You see, that was a real prize to her, that she had the blood of the king of the Jews. Okay, so we look at the egg again. That's Easter, okay? And this is the Easter egg, and you see it in sometimes in old renderings. Uh, it's the, called the sacred egg, the mundane egg. It's associated with the moon. We talked about that. <clears throat> and I kept seeing this symbol over and over of this serpent entwined around uh, the egg. And I, I wanted to know, uh, the first thing I, I, I looked at was this idea that a serpent represents, it represents our DNA. You've seen that symbol many times before. The two joined serpent. We'll see that here in a little bit. But I want you to understand this. In fact, let's go, let's go here. Let's go to the book of Revelation. And I'll, I'll show you something really, you know, I put a lot of thought into this, and I, and I think the Bible is going to reveal some things to us about what is going to happen in the last days. Revelation chapter 13, uh, John says, I st stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw beast rise up um, out of the sea, and he had seven heads and ten horns. And then in Revelation 17, where we have the bloodthirsty fertility harlot, um, we, have, we have a beast in verse 8, that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Well, where is the bottomless pit? Uh, it's actually at the heart of the earth. That's where Jesus went to in the three days prior to his resurrection. He was in the heart of the earth. You might want to say he was like here, okay? And uh, he, he rose again on the third day. He took captivity with him. He set the captives free. And uh, he preached to those spirits in prison, the Bible says. And, um, and down inside this prison... The heart of the earth, the center, the, the core of the earth, down in the heart of that is the beast. That's where he is right now. That's what Revelation 17 says. We're going to see him turn loose here in a little bit. But I got to thinking about this. This is actually pretty interesting because here's a graphic of the, of the planet, earth. And remember, earth is like a woman. She drinks blood. She's fertile. She's all this stuff. But the earth actually, um, and the book of Job says she has a womb. Okay, when the flood waters issued forth as out of a womb, she has a womb. So I want you to think about this. The earth and the egg are pretty much the same because the earth has a core. Well, okay, I actually chipped it a little bit. I hope this is boiled. Uh, the earth has, the egg has a, has a crust, has a hard shell. Okay, and then 
you have the uh, the mantle which is underneath the crust which is like the egg white and then down in the very very center of the in fact here here it is okay you have this one's boiled okay this is the the mantle and this is the core okay this is what we call the moon this is what we always oh yeah that's that's the best part I told you I like these things. Can't let them go to waste. This is a picture of the earth. I'll wait till I'm done to eat, eat the rest of this. But I want you to think about this because as with the egg, it's merely a symbol of a secret that's buried in the heart of the earth waiting for the ground to open up again. Are there going to be earthquakes in the last days? Think about it. Is, um, is there going to be like a, like a flood, something like a flood happened in the last days? Yeah, as it was in the days of Noah. So something is going to come out of the heart of the earth, out of the center of the sacred egg of the earth. Something's going to rise up out of that. Aleister Crowley, Aleister Crowley actually, actually caught on to this. Aleister Crowley was all about chasing after this sacred egg concept. And Crowley wanted to use a secret, okay, the secret of an egg that he was chasing down. I and mean, this guy was weird. But he was chasing down this sort of sacred egg concept to find a secret on how to get in contact with a particular entity that he called Lamb. He actually drew a picture of him. Here it is. Okay, uh, that was a um, an extraterrestrial being <clears throat> that Aleister Crowley was getting in contact with. This 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 being here was very very special to him. And I want you to notice that Crowley's, of course, he looks like an egg, an egg head. Uh, Crowley's drawing of Lamb almost perfectly coincides with what everybody in the whole world is seeing as far as alien contact. Now, is alien contact and the mysteries of the egg related? I'm pretty sure they are. And we're being inundated with this imagery. Do you, re you remember this? Nanu, Nanu. You remember Mork from Ork? TV show back in the 70s. I never used to get to watch it because it came on a Wednesday night. I always had to go to church on Wednesday night. Anyway, Mork is an alien that comes, falls from the heavens in a spaceship that looks like an egg. And everybody thought, that's so funny. The producers actually, or whoever wrote this concept, got this from Crowley, got it from the concept of the sacred egg, that there's a, there's a secret invader going to come to the earth through this symbolism right here. Do you remember Lady Gaga? Lady Gaga and on her way out, what was it, the Grammys or something like that, comes strolling into the Grammys, carried by four guys in an egg. And she talks about how she had this rebirth. She was in there for like three days or something. I don't know how she went to the bathroom. But anyway, she was in there for three days. Everybody says it's a stunt. Uh, she just, she was acting out her mystery religion concept. She actually felt like she was born again when she came out of that egg. And of course, you remember, that's when she introduced the song, Born This Way. Think about it. Okay? Think about it. Uh, I mentioned in reference to the egg, the serpent entwined around the egg. And that looked like, remember this image uh, that we use? We've used this several times. This is an ancient, uh, I think it's a Peruvian textile. Uh, the two serpents twined together. That is actually a universal concept. The concept of the opposites. The concept, it looks like DNA is what it is. And so when you see this egg entwined around, or you see when this serpent entwined around the egg, it sort of gives you the idea that number one, there is something in the heart of the earth, but number two, there's, there's been a seed planted in the DNA of mankind that one of these days is going to, it's going to hatch forth. I'll show you again this idea of um, 
the two serpents representing the opposites, evil and good, west and east, north and south, uh, light and darkness, sun and moon, mother and father, um, and they're both contending for what's called the mundane or the sacred egg. What they're telling you is that in the center, at the center point of these two opposites and the fusion point, is the great secret or what would be the Antichrist. This uh, pagan symbol is related to the two pillars of Freemasonry, Jachin and Boaz. Stop right here. Here again, according to the Bible, Jachin, 23 cubits, Boaz, 23 cubits, 46 cubits apiece. And here we have Jachin and Boaz, and they're fused together, the symbolism of the sun and the moon fusing together, father and mother, and they're fusing together at a, at a circle that looks like an egg, that's the fusion point. You even see the ivy going around Jacob and Boaz looking exactly like DNA. The fusion of heaven and earth together. That concept, of course, comes from the scriptures. Genesis chapter 6, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. When you have the fusion of the opposites in the Bible, in Genesis 6, you have the hybrids. The, the, the mighty men of old, men of renown. The giants, as it were. That's what Og was doing in Ashtaroth. That's why he was there. Daniel chapter 2, a prophecy that this exact same thing is going to happen. I want you to notice the language. Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Stop right here. Iron is known for hardness. Clay is not. You take clay and you can mold it. I preached a sermon last Sunday on vessels. We're vessels in God's hands. God takes and he molds the clay. It's malleable. It's moldable. You can gush it between your fingers. If you, you can't do that with iron. Notice that iron and clay are exact opposites. By the way, you know what's in the center of every star? Iron. You know what's at the core? You know what's at the core of the earth? Hot, molten. I lost my moon. Hot, molten iron. They're going to come down from the heavens. They're going to come up from the earth. There's going to be a big fusion going on in the last days. And they're going to mingle themselves where? Where those serpents are inside the seed of men and produce the hybrids. Every UFO I'm studying right now. Um, aliens. I'm studying um, <clears throat> alien contact, abduction stories, things like that. Trying to treat it from a biblical standpoint. In just about every alien abduction scenario I run into, there's a story of the hybridization of the aliens with the humans. Go watch the X-Files. That's what it was all about, the alien-human hybrid. In fact, just about every UFO slash alien movie that comes out now, there's always a hybrid between the aliens and the humans. I mentioned earlier that eggs, I'm going to get this one because I don't want to drop it again. Eggs are actually mentioned in the scriptures did you know that Easter egg hunting is actually found in the scriptures? Okay, let me show it to you. Isaiah chapter 10 verse 12. Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria. Now the king of Assyria would be like a, a picture of the Antichrist. And the glory of his high looks. For he saith, by the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom. For I am prudent, and I have removed the bounds of the people, and have robbed their treasures. And I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. And, and my hand hath found as a nest to the riches of the people. And as one gathereth eggs that are left, have I gathered all the earth. That's what the king of Assyria said. And there was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth or peeped. The king of Assyria, the Antichrist, is going to go and he's going to gather everybody together just like people gather eggs and they put them all into one basket, which is not wise, by the way. 
Uh, this imagery of the serpent and the egg, read, look at Isaiah chapter 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot say, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid, from his, head, have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue hath muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity, and they speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. Now I want to stop right here. I want you to, we're building up now to what this is all about. God is talking about the iniquity of the people. And the iniquity of the people always has an outcome. Here's the outcome of mankind's iniquity in the last days. Verse 5, they hatch cockatrice eggs. You know what a, co you know what a cockatrice is? It's a serpent. They hatch cockatrice eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. See, it's all about the serpent in the last days associated with the egg. Notice this, what Jesus said in Luke chapter 11. Does it just have symbolic meaning? I think it means something greater than just the symbolism of it. Luke 11, 11, If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he, give, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or verse 12, Or if he shall then ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? The scorpions are mentioned in Revelation chapter 9. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Where is the bottomless pit? It's in the center here. It's at the heart of the earth, the core, the womb. Okay? And he opened the bottomless pit. Boy, I'm glad that's boiled. He opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke. Where did they come from? They came out of the smoke, locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. The scorpions are in the egg. And who's the scorpion king? Remember that movie? Who's the scorpion king? Revelation 9-11, the king of the bottomless pit, Abaddon, Apollyon, the destroyer. You see, there, there's a secret here. And that's what the festival of Ishtar is all about. It's all about the revelation of a mystery in the last days. On Easter Sunday, when everybody else talks about their bunnies and their eggs, we here at Bethel Church, we talk about the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ only. That's what we do. I'm not here to judge everybody else on what you do on Easter. That's your business. I'm not your judge. I'm not going to call. I'm not going to be looking and seeing what you're doing. I don't think any of you really need to do that with anybody else either. If you have a message to send to people, let them know that, number one, we are fast approaching a day where the devil is going to take over the world and Jesus is coming back. Are they saved? Are they ready? That's what I'm asking you. Are you ready? Because one of these days, the egg's going to come open. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. God bless you. We'll see you the next time.